All right, we are recording. I first want to say thank you all so much for joining us today. This is the second episode of the Downtown Revitalization webinar series. Uh, my name is Shane Barton. I'm the Downtown Revitalization Coordinator for the Community and Economic Development Initiative of Kentucky, uh, often called SEDIC. Uh, and today we are joined by our guest with the Kentucky Heritage Council. Um, and we're going to be talking about historic tax credits, historic uh, or the National Historic Registry. And then also we're going to be really uh, sort of speaking to a specific example uh, that comes out of Williamsburg, Kentucky, and explore their process of navigating uh, all of this content. And then uh, we'll also sort of circle back and, and highlight an, a new opportunity that they are currently able to take advantage of because of uh, uh, some of the investments, not only in energy, but programming uh, that they've done that they'll explain that has most certainly positioned them better to take advantage of a current grant that they've been given access to. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Kitty Duguid uh, with the Kentucky Heritage Council and Executive Director of the Kentucky Main Street Program, one of our partners that works in a number of communities. Uh, and she's going to uh, sort of start the introduction and, and introduce us to some of her colleagues at the Heritage Council, and then we'll go ahead and jump right into this. If you have questions, uh, please feel free to enter those into the chat box at any time, and we will circle back to those. If for any reason we run out of time, I will make sure to follow up with our guest and have all of our answers, all of our questions answered, and I'll package that to make sure it, it also uh, joins or is available with the webinar once it's available on our website. So Kitty, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thanks for having us this morning and thanks for all of you who have joined us in attending this workshop. Um, I would like to thank my colleagues, Lisa Thompson and Eric Rollins, who will be doing some presentations this morning, as well as my main street director in Williamsburg, Miss Nanny Hayes. And we, Lisa, Eric and I all work for the Kentucky Heritage Council. And Shane, if you throw up that slide, I will explain just a little bit quickly about what we do. Um, my role at the Heritage Council is I am the um, state coordinator for Kentucky's Main Street program. And that is not what we're looking for. Um, <laughs> and in addition to that, I am also the um, site ID manager. And so there are several programs that we have. Try the next one. There we go. Um, so our agency is part of the Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet, and we are typically known as the State Historic Preservation Office. And so we identify, we protect above ground, below ground, um, and you will see a number of things that we do in addition to what we're speaking about today. We have archaeologists, we have several commissions that fall under our preview, African American, Native American, Martin Luther King, military, we do it all. Um, one of the things that we do that we seek input from you is on the State Historic Preservation Plan. And that plan is not a plan of the Heritage Council, that plan is for the Commonwealth. And a little bit later in the year, we will be reaching out to you um, to get your input for the what you would like to see in the state of Kentucky. So we do all of those um, activities in our office. Next. So I'm glad to have Nanny with us here today and she's gonna talk a little bit about the process that she encountered in Williamsburg. So good morning, Nanny. Good morning. <laughs> it's early, but good morning. Uh, this is a picture of a building that was built in the late 1800s and it was still standing a few years ago but due to neglect uh, it could not be saved it really couldn't it was a health hazard so it was going to come down uh, Sandy you'll enjoy this this is the curb building originally you know the building uh, built probably by your great-grandfather-in-law uh, uh, we hated to lose this building. It was a three-story building. The top had a ballroom. It had offices in the center, and it was business downtown. But when that building was get, was sold the final time, we had rumors of things that were going to go in there, and one was a 
parking garage. And we weren't real thrilled with that idea to be stuck in the middle of air downtown. So it was decided to, to make it complimentary to the rest of the town that we probably needed to establish a historic preservation commission, which with the help of the mayor, we did. And that started us on looking at establishing a historic district for the mere fact that we wanna be able to have, to have a little say so, it doesn't stop people. You've got to remember, it does not stop people from doing what they wanna do, but we wanna be complimentary and encourage them to do that. And I will say in doing a historic district, your biggest thing is education. You've got to educate your community because there's all kinds of myths out there that Lisa can speak to that people have. You can't do this, you can't do that. That's not true. It just designates them as a historic district. And with that comes some, some advantages such as historic credits. The process of doing it, and I will say, if you've got a Main Street program in your community, it helps make that process so much easier because as a Main Street director, we are required to keep building inventories of every building in our district. And the, your favorite person in doing this is your PVA because he can help you a lot. But taking air building inventories that I have with Main Street and then to go and have to do the building surveys for the historic district was 100% easier because most of the legwork was already done. It was just a, a thing of cut and pasting. So your Main Street director will be a great asset if you're gonna to try to do this. Um, it took us about eight months to put it together. And then we sent it with, uh, with the gentleman to the state to be presented, you don't have to. You don't have to hire a consultant. It could, it could all be done within yourself. The the heritage council is a great help. They're going to help you any way you need to be helped. Don't be afraid of them. They look a little scary sometimes, but they're not. They're really very nice people, and they'll help help you any way you want to. And so that's basically why we started. We wanted to ensure that our downtown kept its it's flavor that it's there. Uh, you know, we don't want to lose our, his, our historic tourism part of that. We want to make sure it stays like it was. And losing this building was a sad day. Uh, it broke all of our hearts, but sometimes it can't be helped. Anything else? So, um, that was a great introduction, Nanny. Thank you for that. Um, I'm Lisa Thompson. I'm the National Register Coordinator. And um, so let me, the National Register of Historic Places is the official list of the nation's historic places worthy of preservation. It's um, authorized by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. And it's the National Park Services Historic Places program and we help coordinate that and support public and private efforts to identify, evaluate, and protect America's historic and archaeological resources. Next. So the National Register of Historic Places officially recognizes historic significant sites or areas. It encourages but does not require preservation and it requires a review process to identify historic properties that may be harmed by harmful federally funded, licensed, or permitted activities. And as Nanny said, one of the biggest benefits is, is that it may qualify owners for state and federal rehabilitation tax credits or for easement donations. Next. As I said earlier, the National Register of Historic Places was created in 1966 as part of the National Preservation Act. Um, and the system, this process, is managed by the State's Historic Preservation Office. Kentucky is really fortunate in that we have the fourth highest number of places listed on the National Register, which encompasses about 3,400 individual listings, which includes 42,000 different resources. Of those in Kentucky, there are 537 historic districts. 
So a historic district could be a commercial area, it could be residential, or in Williamsburg cases, it's actually a combination of historic and resident, uh, commercial and residential homes. It could be large farms, it could be a campus, a school. Um, but you'll notice on this map that there are very few listings in Eastern Kentucky. And the um, Heritage Council is working hard to change that. So how do we get something listed on the National Register? Well, and it's, it's the essence of it, it's a very bureaucratic form. And so we look at four different ways to uh, evaluate the criteria of, a, of an individual listing or a district. You've got history, which are really your events. B is really hard, it's about the people, but it has to be more than just George Washington slept here. You have to tie the property to the person's importance. C is architecture. I don't know why they didn't make that A, but C is about architecture. And D is the properties that you yield either because they're important for prehistoric or history, but simply it's just archeology. span We also have, uh, go back one. Um, there are also different five different building types so you've got buildings, a site, a structure, an object, and again, in this case, what we've been talking about is a district. The other interesting thing is, is that there's also different levels of significance. So you've got national, state, and local. So like the Pentagon is nationally significant because it has a role that's significant to the nation as a whole, but our state capital would be significant at a state level. But by far, the most properties listed are within a local context because they are important to the history and development of a local community. Next. <coughs> so simply said, when some people call me and they want to list something on the National Register, I ask them these three questions. Is it old enough? It's got to be at least 50 years older. Is it significant enough? So what happens there? Tell me the story. What's the hook about why this place is special to you? And is it intact enough? Does it have integrity? Has it, does it look and feel the same as when it did in the period of when it was significant? Next. So in the grand scheme, we're really just talking about a process. It's many steps. Um, and as Nanny said, it took them about eight months to get all the pre-documentation um, prepared. And it's not unusual for it to take about a year for us to go through the whole process. It's really important for everyone to realize that anyone can prepare this form. Um, we work, and I work every day with, with folks that don't have master's degree in historic preservation, but just simply care about a special place that they wanna help preserve and to honor. So I think it's really important that we realize again that anybody can prepare these forms. Next. So one of the first things that Nanny and the team in Williamsburg did is they started to look at the history. So what's the context? What's the hook? What's going to be the story that's special about Williamsburg? And so it was created as a county seat in 1818. Next. And the railroad arrived in 1882. Next. And then Sanborn maps, I don't know how many of you will know about Sanborn maps, but they're really fire insurance maps. And they were created for almost every community across the country. And preservationists use them to really sort of help tell the story of a place. Um, and so they, they really start in the late 1800s, work their way up to 1950s, 60s. And it really shows you the evolution of a community. And so Sanborn maps really sort of talked about how in 1901, you started to see the building of the Main Street area come together. And that sort of became the basis of the, the, the essence of how Williamsburg was created. Next. So surveys are really important part in this and as Nanny alluded as a Main Street program they really sort of already had a really good basis of what their building inventory was but we she they really started to look specifically at individual buildings so the next couple slides you can just skip through here really sort of really quickly Shane 
So, you know, there's Main Street looking south. They want to look down the other side of Main Street. Um, the Baptist Church was built in 1926. Um, the public library was in 1960. Um, and there's a 1931 courthouse that had a 1971 um, renovation done to it. Um, the Board of Education building was built in 1982. Um, they do have a new downtown judicial center in 2011. And then here's a little slide of um, 312 Main Street, some, some historic buildings that have been modified. So what is a historic district? So for our purposes, it's really a significant concentration or a linkage of building structures and objects that tie together and create a physical plan. And so you also then take the old enough, significant enough and intact enough and you sort of start to look at those elements with your survey. And so as it turned out, there were 86 resources that they surveyed in Williamsburg. And they looked at also the condition of the buildings and whether they were contributing or non-contributing to the historic district. They looked at streets, the landscaping, vegetation, paths, walkway, open spaces, vacant lots. And all of these things were considered as part of the district settings. What you see now on the screen is is part of what's um, embedded into the National Register nomination. But you'll notice that over the course of them preparing the document for uh, Williamsburg, that building that sort of spurred all of this in the beginning that Nanny talked about, the triplet grocery store, had been demolished. And so here you see it in the official record as just a, a, a vacant parcel. And so now it's non-contributing to the district. So how do you create a map? So here's the map of Williamsburg. Um, and so we looked at the river, the railroad, your main street, um, and you think about sort of what are the man-made features, um, political boundaries, what's the age of the buildings and the architectural style. Next slide. And so what, would, so what ended up happening after all of this analysis and research is that we landed on criteria A, and so that is an event, and it's really about community planning and development. And we looked at a period of significance from 1882 to 1971. Next slide. And so it turned out there were 61 contributing resources, 57 buildings, three structures, one object, and then there are 25 non-contributing resources. And so why is that important? Because when you go to evaluate whether a property is eligible for tax credits, we look at its status, whether it contributes, does it add to the historic character of the historic district, or does it not add, or is it non-contributing to the historic district? And so only contributing buildings are eligible for the tax credit. So in Williamsburg, there are 61 buildings or resources that are eligible for the tax credit now after this. So it was finally listed on May 25th, 2019. Um, so that's a very, that's a very good thing. We're very happy about that. Next slide. And so I want to spend a little bit of time and Nanny touched on this. So what is, what is it? the National Register, because there are so many myths out there. The National Register does not prevent an owner from remodeling, repairing, altering, selling, or even demolishing their building. And it does not obligate you to make repairs or improvements to your property. It doesn't, I've even heard where people think that sometimes does it mean that I have to have my, my property open to the public so many days a year or something like that. None of that is the case. And I do like to add that it doesn't include, it does not include a little bronze plaque. So everyone asks about that. Next slide. 
So I, I do want to spend a little bit more time on this because I really think that there are a lot of misconceptions about what the National Register of Historic Places means. So usually when you have a, a downtown historic or downtown commercial district, there are different players that are involved. So you might have a historical society, somebody who's more humanity owners um, driven, who um, wants to tell the story about a place. Um, but if you do have a local historical society, they do not tell you what you can and cannot do with your building. Same with the National Register of Historic Places. It does not prevent you from making any changes to your property. And the Historic Preservation Commission, which Nanny said that in Williamsburg, they did create, and there is a formal review process, but it is separate from being on the National Register of Historic Places. I think in Williamsburg case, they wanted to create that local historic um, preservation commission so that any changes that were made to the district could be monitored. The community had a big uprising when they felt like they were losing a very historic landmark corner building and they were upset about that, which is actually how a lot of preservation um, movements start. And so as a community, they decided that it was really important to, to maintain their downtown. And by doing that, they created a historic preservation commission that does look at changes that a property owner makes, but it is no way connected to the National Register of Historic Places. So again, historic register doesn't impact that. But I would like to review what before closing and turning it over to Eric, what the actual benefits of the National Register are. So it, prost it pro fosters pride of place and appreciation for one's cultural heritage. And it maintains and enhances property values. It also provides economic and other incentives to promote conservation and preservation and it sustains and improves the quality of life by maintaining the neighborhood character. And mostly it establishes eligibility for state and federal tax incentives. So I'd like to introduce you now to Eric Rawlings, our staff architect, and Eric's going to talk to you a little bit about what the tax credit program is. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm Eric Rawlings, staff architect. I'm one of the two tax credit application reviewers at the Heritage Council. And so I'm one of the primary contacts when it comes to projects that involve the rehabilitation tax credit. Um, so I'm just gonna try and touch on the highlights of the tax credit. Um, we're always here to answer questions. Um, our contact information is at the end of the presentation. So, Obviously, I think there'll be questions that are raised by the, the content here. Um, so don't, don't hesitate to reach out. But like I said, I'm gonna go over the highlights. Um, I wanna point out, first of all, that the tax credit is not a tax deduction. They're not the same thing. Um, basically, the tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction of uh, tax liability. So for example, if you owe 10,000 in taxes, and have a $10,000 historic tax credit, you wouldn't pay any taxes. The, the tax credit would wipe out your tax liability. Um, the state tax credit is refundable. There's, there's two uh, kind of tax credits and I'll get into the details of those in a few slides. There's a federal tax credit and a state tax credit. There are differences between the two. Um, uh, but I just want to point out that the federal tax credit is a, uh, a carry forward tax credit while the state tax credit is refundable. Um, at the end of the day, we recommend consulting with a tax professional. As always, we can give a certain level of, of advice, but uh, for a commercial project, you'll need to employ a CPA for the, the uh, application. And we also recommend strongly consulting with our agency first before starting a project. Um, so I'm just gonna go over the three primary criteria for the tax credit. Uh, first of all, the building must be individually listed or contributing in a national registered district as Lisa pointed out. You must make a substantial investment. And what this means is for commercial buildings, 
you must invest the larger of $20,000 or the adjusted basis of the building. Uh, people get really confused about the adjusted basis. Uh, it's basically the purchase price of the building minus the value of the land minus any depreciation taken. So it's really trying to concentrate down to what the value of the building is. Um, for a residential project, the minimum of investment is just that $20,000 amount. So there's two kind of, there's multiple categories uh, for primary personal residential, uh, it's a $20,000 investment. And the last point is the work, and this is what we're gonna touch on the most today. The work must follow the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. So I just want to touch on the four different standards for treatment of historic properties. Um, the first is a preservation standard, and this is probably what most people think about when they think of historic preservation, obviously because the term is in the name itself. Uh, this boils down to basically protection of a building. Um, there used to be two standards in this category called protection and stabilization, and those have been combined. The second is a restoration standard, and this is basically restoring the building to a place and time that was significant to the building. Oftentimes, it's the construction date of the building, and this is really like a museum quality restoration of a building. Uh, the third is reconstruction, and this is when a building or a portion of a building has been lost, and it's like the term said, it's a reconstruction. Uh, using a high level of detail and historic documentation to recreate a portion or the whole building itself. Uh, the final is rehabilitation, and this is the one that applies to the tax credit. As the name implies, it's a rehabilitation tax credit. And this acknowledges the need to alter or add to a historic property, make continuing or changing uses while retaining the property's historic character. So let's talk about the 10 points briefly. Um, these establish the criteria uh, for the treatment of ab above and below ground historic resources. Um, I'll let you all read through this briefly while I talk. Um, as you can see, these place an emphasis on protecting historic features and archeological resources. It's all about preserving and protecting um, the historic resources of a property. And these standards are more or less the starting point for a rehab project. We have documents and guidance that can um, go towards and elaborate on these. And I don't wanna get into the weeds too much about that, but just if you remember one thing, it's there's 10 points for rehabilitation standard. And these are basically about protecting historic uh, character of the property. So I want to talk about the rehabilitation standard in a little more detail. Um, the example I use most is kind of the introduction of plumbing and electrical into a building. You know, 150 years ago, buildings largely didn't have bathrooms or electricity. Obviously, we don't expect you to remove all your plumbing and install outhouses on your property. Um, instead, this standard allows you to modify your building so that it meets the current needs while pre preserving the historic elements of a building. Uh, the rehab standard also acknowledges that changes may have been made over the course of time that do not meet current needs for a building. Um, one example is the practice of closing off second story windows. As you can see in this example, uh, this building was either built with maintenance in mind and the second floor was um, used for storage or at some point, this building underwent a, a, a renovation that closed off and, and created a slip cover on this building, closing off the second story windows. Um, and since these changes are not often architecturally distinct, reopening or reintroducing those windows is something that is often approvable under the rehab standard. Uh, this is an example in Williamsburg. This is a, a large scale project, multi million dollar project. It did not employ the tax credits, but some of the concepts can be drawn from this project. Um, obviously, the installation of windows and a blank facade opens up the second floor for residential use, where it, it didn't really have those capabilities before. And um, 
you know, some projects involve an investment that significantly exceeds that $20,000 mark or substa substantial investment. Um, luckily, the tax credit can benefit projects that are 50,000 or 50 million. Slide. So in some cases, this is what I mentioned, it, it would not be appropriate to make changes to an architecturally distinct feature that is not original to the building. In some cases, these second floors were covered with elaborate, uh, high level of design, um, new architectural features. And such an elaborate facade has, in, in these cases, gained historical significance. And therefore, it wouldn't be appropriate to remove this in the context of a rehab standard. In cases like this, we would want to see a use for the building uh, carried through that maintained a facade like this. We wouldn't want to see such an elaborate facade removed. So Lisa talked um, a little bit about contributing versus non-contributing. Like I mentioned, in order to be eligible for the tax credits, you have to be contributing in a district. And unfortunately, many downtown buildings have had changes that compromise their historic integrity. And the building has, a, um, like I mentioned just now, it has to be contributing. So let's talk about a way, there are ways to make a quote non-contributing building contribute to the district after these changes have been made. Uh, usually subtractive changes are harder to overcome than additive changes. You know, subtractive changes are something like complete removal of a facade or removal of historic windows and fenestration, whereas additive changes are things like infilling those windows or covering the facade or installing vinyl siding, things that can be undone with some level of, of work applied to it. Um, this is, uh, go back to that slide real quick, Shane. So this is a model called Mr. Muddle that we have a separate presentation for. And it talks about all these changes that have occurred to buildings over the last hundred years in many downtown settings. And, you know, appropriate treatments to either make the building contributing again or meet the standards in a project that is a rehabilitation. Um, so in short, many of the changes to a building that were made to reduce maintenance in the case of covering windows or modernize a building in the case of installing uh, an HVAC, you know, an air conditioner over the front door, those can be un undone to make the building contributing again. So you can, next slide. So to reiterate and kind of touch on what Lisa uh, said the rehab standard is only required to be followed when there's state or federal dollars at stake. Those include the tax credits that I've been talking about or uh, the Main Street facade grants, which we'll get into in a, a few minutes. Um, some projects do not always involve or require a mega, you know, a large scale investment. Um, we use examples like re roofing a building, replacing replacement windows or repairing historic windows and adding you know internal HVAC to replace through wall units for example those are things that people you know don't really think of as historic preservation but it is rehabilitation of a building and a project such as this would be eligible for the tax credits as long as it's in a national registered district or individually listed and the project meets the standards. Next. So what are eligible expenses? We like to say almost anything, um, largely any improvement to a building is an eligible expense, not just things that, like I just said, improve the historic character of a building. Um, other things such as architects fees, accounting fees, developer fees, engineering, those are also eligible credit, uh, eligible expenses. And so when you add all this up, it's, you know, in a lot of ways, it's easy to meet the substantial investment requirements, do a project that 
rehabilitates the building for current use and you know doesn't necessarily break the bank. Next slide. So eligible expenses uh, or ineligible expenses, I guess. Um, you know, new additions to a building, any increase in square footage that is not, there are some minor exceptions like an increase in square footage that may add accessible um, considerations uh, like an elevator, for example. Um, other than this, in limited cases, new additions are not eligible costs. Tearing down a building, you know, not in a, you know, demolition of an interior um, and tearing down a portion of a building would not be an eligible expense. Other landscape type items, you know, hardscaping or softscaping are not eligible ex expenses. The purchase of the building, uh, obviously the purchase price can be significant, but that's not an eligible expense in this case. And non-permanent items, things that are not, uh, you know, you couldn't walk out with them in 10 minutes, like a cabinet, for example. Uh, next slide. So I wanna talk about, um, sort of get close to wrapping up with kind of the mechanism of the tax credit and some of the percentages. Um, the federal tax credit is always a full 20%. So whether you invest 50,000 or 500 million, I think the Chrysler building was a, a federal tax credit uh, rehab, which was many millions of dollars, 20% of those expenses went towards and were eligible for the tax credit. The state is a little bit different since there is a funding gap. Uh, we only have $5 million plus any recaptured um, credits. So any unused credits, you know, that's what we consider recaptured. You know, if they're not used after three years, we, we take, you know, recapture those and reallocate them. Um, so that's why the state credit is not always up to the 20% for a commercial project. It usually averages close to 15 to 17%, but still when you're, you're considering a third of the investment coming back in tax credits, that's a substantial amount. And again, there is a, a residential primary personal residence tax credit, and that's up to 30%. Again, I'm sorry, I got the percentages wrong. The, the, the commercial is 10 to 12, the uh, primary residence is closer to 15 to 17. So just keep that in mind when considering the tax credit. And you can go to the next slide. And I just wanted to kind of wrap up talking about uh, the Eastern Kentucky region. This is kind of a breakdown of both the um, fifth district and the promise zone. As you can see there, the promise zone showing up in kind of the purple color. And in a lot of ways the tax credit in these this region has been underutilized you know there have only been 11 commercial projects in district 5 since 2005 you know we're coming up on the 16th year of the credit and i think last year in jefferson county alone there were 13 certified projects so um, you can see that you know obviously as lisa mentioned there's less resources in this part of the state um, but there are still opportunities for investment uh, towards the, you know, with the tax credit as leveraging uh, some of those expensive expenses back. Um, and as far as the promise zone, um, there have only been two commercial projects in 16 years. Uh, luckily, we've received two more applications in 2020. So if those are certified eventually, that would double the amount of projects that were certified. And we're only hoping for more from there. So I guess at this point, uh, that kind of concludes my portion. I'll turn it back over to Kitty to, to kind of talk about the facade grant program that I mentioned briefly and go from there. I'm thanking you that I was muted. Um, so one of the things that Williamsburg was eligible for because they are a nationally accredited Main Street program Last year, there was an opportunity for states to apply for a national grant. And Kentucky was fortunate to be selected as one of those states. 
and that happened just a year ago last Friday. So we were pretty excited about that. And um, once Kentucky was chosen, we had had several of our communities submit applications that they would like to participate. Those applications were vetted by us and then they were submitted to the national program. So the national program was um, who chose our three communities. So our office did not choose them. So the process was the local programs that were nationally accredited applied to us. We made sure everything was in order. We submitted those to the national program and then that's how they were chosen. So that program um, has allowed the communities that are participating to receive grants, not from the state, but from a national organization because they were made possible um, through a sub-grant and they are administered by the National Park Service. And each community um, was eligible from two to nine grants that were up to $25,000 each. Um, next slide, please. And those three communities are Maysville, Shelbyville and Williamsburg. So they, we have a, a northern city, if you will, a central Kentucky, and then of course, eastern Kentucky with Williamsburg. Um, these have been small scale facade improvements that help to change some of those buildings that Eric was talking about earlier and allowing those um, property owners to make those investments then it has changed the image of the downtown. It is preserving the cultural heritage of the community. And it was something that will then parlay into other people and events happening in, in those communities. Um, facade grants sometimes are administered on a local level. Sometimes we have had them at a state level in the past, but I always think about it, if you think about a, a community or your neighborhood and somebody plants flowers and all of a sudden their, their property looks really nice, then you will start to see someone else in the neighborhood plant flowers. And pretty soon it doesn't take very long that everybody has changed the complexion of the neighborhood. And the same happens when you have facade grants. So it takes one person, you know, building a building or repairing a building those could also be a building that it was a bigger project that made them eligible for the historic tax credits in addition to a facade grant. So it's, it was a way to um, revitalize and rehab the downtown and to increase the economic vitality in a, a community. One thing I do want to make really clear because it has been in the, the news lately about the historic tax credit being expanded. Those credits do not come back to the person until that project is complete. So no one is getting money to do a project up front. So they have to submit the application and work with Eric or Mike, get it approved, do the work. And typically that building, you know, you've paid the, the construction workers or whoever's doing the work. The building is then in service and usually operating a business before they get the credit. So they are only get a, getting a portion of something back to them after they have made a big investment. So it's, it's not like we give you the money and hope you do a good thing. It is um, a way for basically it's sort of a, a reward for doing the right thing and it helps the entire community. So um, don't, don't anybody think we're giving just away money for free. There are some, some caveats that, because in a historic tax credit, that's public money in a way, and we want to assure that your investment is protected and you are getting a good return on that investment. And I think any time that we can rehabilitate a community or a property, that's a really good investment into a, a community.
Sorry about that, Kitty. I, I was I was trying to move us to the next slide and did not realize that that was <laughs> there the wasn't last a slide, slide to go to. That's and there right. wasn't there wasn't another one to go to. Um, we we've got about ten minutes. First, I just want to say thank you. That was a lot, and I think that actually confronted some of the misconceptions that maybe I hold or that I have heard other people share. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, before we jump into questions, I have seen a number of chats, uh, chat questions and conversations come up, and I so appreciate that. One thing I do want to remind folks, I, we've had a couple people join. If you are here uh, and you did not share your contact information in the chat, uh, please do that. In particular, if you are an extension agent joining us today for CURS credit, please make sure you put your contact information in the chat feature so we can give you credit for that. Um, before we open it up, can, can everyone join me in just giving our speakers a round of applause? You, we, our guests that watch this later may not hear it, but uh, thank, thank you all. Uh, one thing that, that I want to circle back to, just because it, it did come up in our first webinar, and in particular as we're thinking about downtown revitalization, not just in the Promise Zone, but throughout, throughout the, the region and throughout the state, your best friend at your local level should be your PVA officer or administrator, because we have heard the PVA office, both webinars that we've held so far, really be elevated as an incredible resource that often goes underutilized, especially when we're talking about specific buildings, whether we're referring back to the great work that folks in Harlan did, like, like Laura, who's joining us today, and their inventory of Harlan, or even uh, what Lisa was talking about in terms of that registration process and identifying buildings. So make sure that if you're doing this work, you, you do uh, build a relationship with your PVA uh, administrator. I want to open it up uh, to any questions. Um, if you have a question that uh, you'd like maybe to elevate from the chat box or share, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and we'll go ahead and share those now. Can I can I make a, a comment or I guess answer a question that Laura had about Harland? Yes, please. Um, yeah, so Harlan actually has a um, historic district that's on the National Register um, downtown. It was, um, so its period of significance is 1910 to 1936. So you probably likely have about, I don't know, 35 to 50 buildings that are downtown that are already listed on the National Register. So I think the thing that Laura and I should do is get together and sort of go through that list and so that I can help determine which ones are contributing and which ones are non-contributing. And that might be a really good thing for her to add to her charts and maps that she's keeping track of. Thank, thank you for answering that. And, and Laura, if there's anything that I can do to support you all or, or Lisa in that conversation, please, please let me know. <clears throat> any, any other questions? Um, before I, I've always got comments to make, so I'm holding back on my comments, trying to open up the floor for other folks. If there are any other questions, please, please feel free to unmute yourself and share them. Is there a market for nonprofits to be able to sell tax credits if they qualify for them? So that's a very good question. Um, there has been a mechanism for nonprofits, municipalities, um, and an other, it's basically an other category. Um, they apply to the bank franchise tax is the way that they can be transferred or sold. Um, we're currently looking, our understanding is an agency and we're currently trying to investigate or facilitate a way because it's our understanding the bank franchise tax ended January 1st of this year. And so we're working with uh, our, our uh, cabinet, Tourism, Arts and Heritage, the finance cabinet to try and continue to be able to utilize the tax credit in that way. So I don't have a good answer today. You know, there is, we're, we're still, we have reviewed applications that have come in 
up until the end of the year. I don't know that we have gotten one since December 31st. Um, but if you want to just take down my contact information or I can take yours and once I have a better answer for that, I can uh, let you know. I know that's kind of a non-answer. <laughs> Um, well, but it says that there used to be, um, which means that chances are there will be again. And exactly. I think the important part, and we don't, you know, I don't, well, I do have a specific example, but that's okay. They need to call you. Uh, but, uh, but it does say to me that there is room for those that are non, uh, non for profit organizations to benefit, uh, or at least there has been in the past and there's likely to be in the future. Yes. That's absolutely how I would assess it as well. Because mm -hmm. we've used them on courthouses and schools and, and lots of other things. Um, I will mention, Sandy had asked a question in the chat and I did answer it, but everyone might not have seen this. Um, this was an example of how I think some people have gotten a negative concept of preservation. There's a gentleman who lives on Richmond Road in Lexington and the columns on his home are painted red, white, and blue, and he has a big sign in the yard, and it's been there, I think, almost since I was in college. But you have to realize Lexington also has local historic districts, and they have specific ordinances, and they have what's called the Board of Architectural Review. This gentleman, um, when when you're doing preservation work, there are this, those national standards, and that is what Lexington goes by. And this particular home, and I can't remember if they were square and he wanted round or vice versa, but he wanted to change the columns on his home. And it would have been inappropriate to the structure. So instead of fixing anything, he put up those that are there now, which are also inappropriate, put up his painted them red, white, and blue. And they have been there um, to the point where now they may have gained historic significance for being on the house. Um, but it was his own sort of personal protest. And had his home been in the neighborhood there, which is Bell Court, if it had been back in the court, no one would have probably ever seen them very often. But the fact that he had um, a prominent place, that was his protest. Um, so it had nothing to do with being in a National Register district. It had nothing to do with tax credits because at the time that occurred, I'm not even sure we had a tax credit program. It was just his, his personal defiance against the historic preservation ordinance for his local district, which is administered locally in Lexington. So it doesn't happen to everyone, but we try to think of this as how can we educate people to use the best materials that are going to last so that they don't have to redo those. Replacement windows are called that for a reason. You get to replace them a lot. Um, but we see it as an education so that you make the best investment in your property that is going to last a significant amount of time and be appropriate to the structure. Thank you, Kitty. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I'm going to sneak in my question really quick because I think it, it's going to relate to next month's webinar. Um, so w our first webinar covered vacant and underutilized buildings. This webinar ha has touched on historic districts and tax credits. Tax credits. Next month, I'm going to try to, to bring in some guests to talk about the Kentucky Brownfields program. Because as I'm thinking about a lot of these buildings are connected. So the question that I want to pose is can you all, any of you all, speak to how the Brownfields program, whether it be assessments or remediation or cleanup, how does that play with the historic tax credits or these historic buildings? And, and is there any sort of particular things that we should be thinking about as we try to perhaps leverage both programs on some of our structures in our communities? Mm -hmm. I'll open that up to anyone who can answer. I thought Eric was going to say something. Um, they can be used for both. I would, I'll use um, the example in Middlesbrough, which may or may not ever happen, but it could have. So let's put it that way. 
There is a, a significant building on Cumberland Avenue that was the formal, former Elks home. It is a beautiful facade. It was a beautiful building that has basically demolition by neglect. It has sat vacant for a really long time. That property is eligible for a Brownsfield grant, meaning that they would come in, remove the asbestos, those kinds of things, so that they could in, then in turn do a rehabilitation project using the tax credit program because it is in a national registered district. So they can be parlayed into to both, both areas for rehabilitation. Okay. Yeah, I think they use the Brownfield grant at the Columbia Theater in Paducah too. Um, but I don't know if they coupled it with a tax credit project, but they successfully used it in Paducah. Awesome. Thank you. The one, th the one thing, and I'll just jump in real quick. The one thing about grants and the tax credit is, the, and just to make it a little more explicit, the grants can be used as funding that is then, you know, applied to that dollar for dollar amount or the the credit amount, the expenditure amount. So it's sort of double dipping, you know, for the state tax credit, it's sort of legal double dipping in a way. You get a grant and that all that funding can apply towards the tax credit. It's not like your grant funding is eliminated from the qualified expenses. So that's just another way to kind of maximize those dollars and leverage even more. Wow, I, I, I was not aware of that, but that is a great point to know, I think, especially as we start to move forward with this idea of stacking capital uh, mm -hmm. and, and really uh, making these investments in specific buildings. Well, folks, we, we have reached the end of the hour and the top of the next hour and our webinar, uh, uh, while I, I know we could carry this conversation on and, and, and I have a feeling that some of us will continue to carry this conversation on after this webinar, I don't want anyone to feel pressure to, to remain with us if you have an upcoming commitment at 11. Uh, but if, if you would like to stay, we may have some other questions, but I would invite you if, if you need to leave to go ahead. Uh, and this recording will be made available on our website. I will make sure to send it out to all of our participants today, as well as our uh, sort of ongoing contact list. Um, but I would like to open it up if there are maybe one or two last remaining questions that we can capture. Uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, I did want to share one comment and, and also to sort of elevate the work there in Williamsburg. Uh, in the presentation, uh, Lisa shared a, a picture of the lot, uh, the, the non-contributing lot uh, that was once home to a very contributing structure. What I wanna come back to is that that lot has really played a significant role uh, over the last year or two in that community. Uh, because while it may be seen as a non-contributing piece within the, the, the overall realm of historic preservation, what that lot has become is a center point for, for human aggregation if you will, uh, that a, a group of local citizens came together and, and have started to utilize that space in a way to recapture it for people. Uh, and they are currently now holding and planning uh, for, for festivals, music, food called the River Fog Festival. And they've, they've installed uh, public art in that site. So, you know, while, we, while it may not be a contributing site in terms of the broad spectrum of historic designation, I do want to reiterate that just because it has that doesn't mean it's not a, a contributing site to the overall community in the way that people are looking at that lot right now today. So I did want to just circle back to that. Uh, but if, if there are any other commercial, commercials, I feel like I'm saying a commercial, <laughs> if there are any other comments, uh, or questions, please feel free to share them and, and we'll go ahead and wrap up here in just a few. Creative placemaking. I will do a commercial. Um, if you are on Facebook, the organization called Downtown Happy Hour, they have been having what they call the three-day vendor conference. Um, it started last year when everything was shut down and all of our conferences went to virtual. And they have free sessions. Um, it started yesterday. They have sessions today and tomorrow from noon to about four o'clock. Um, so there's, you might find some things that uh, would be of interest to you. So you can log on and it's free. So 
you know, all training is always good. You don't have to agree or disagree. It's just an opportunity for you. That's right. Well, thank yeah. you, Kitty. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, it, it sounds like the moral of today's story is that there is no harm in going after a historic district designation, that it's not going to prevent you from doing anything to your building, but what it will do is provide you access to a, a, a pot of resources that may help you move that project forward. So as we all move forward in our own communities, working on specific buildings, facing specific challenges, if this comes up in your purview, uh, or if you have more additional questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or any of our guests today. Uh, and and I, if you reach out to me, I will make sure to forward those on and, and continue that conversation. But it has been a pleasure. And again, I thank all of you for your time and joining us today. Uh, I will be sending out uh, notifications of the webinar uh, where you can share that if you would like. And then in the near future, I'll also be sending out uh, a notification about our upcoming webinar that is yet to be scheduled for next month, focusing on brownfields. So uh, without further ado, you all have a great day and uh, we will all talk soon, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for participating today. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you all.